Hello, everybody. God bless you. Happy Wednesday. We are live for another Tea Time and Bible Study. I'm so excited you guys are joining today. As always, I have my tea ready to go. I got my passion for tea today. I hope you have your tea ready as well and your Bible ready as well. We're going to go through such an exciting chapter today. It's it's so awesome because the Lord gave me this revelation a few weeks ago. Um, I've read Hebrews chapter seven many times, but I have never had the revelation that um, I've I've had recently in terms of Hebrew chapter Hebrews chapter seven fulfilling prophecy. Uh, in Psalm 110 and also Genesis 14, 18, which we're going to get through. Uh, I'm so excited you guys are joining today. God bless everyone. Hallelujah. You know, last night was a little crazy with the um, with the debate. I know some people are asking me what I thought. I mean, I've, I've tweeted live, but um, after a crazy, weird night last night, I think it's always great to jump into the Word of God and just to be um, refreshed and just seek the Lord and read His Word. And it's always so exciting because the Bible is a living, breathing book. It was inspired by God and the Holy Spirit. Um, through these men that wrote the Bible. And it's it, it, there's so much in here. There's so much in here. It's a living book because every time you read the Bible, you it gets deeper and deeper. You get more and more revelation, which is why I love studying it. I love reading it. I know you guys love reading it too. And um, let's jump into it. So Hebrews chapter seven, um, I know there's probably a lot of you that uh, are aware of the revelation in Hebrews chapter seven in terms of how it relates to King Melchizedek being a representation of the Messiah to come, of Jesus Christ to come. I'm sure many of you, you many of you guys, it's not the first time you're hearing this. For me, it is. Um, I'm always late to the party, so uh, I just found this out and I couldn't believe it. It blew my mind. I tweeted about it like three weeks ago, and I was like, "Wow, this is incredible!" So I'm really excited to go through this today. I um, have your comments up, guys. We're live on Facebook and also on, um, on Periscope. God bless you. Let's open up the word. Blake, God bless you. Hallelujah. Hello, hello. Okay, so we are going to be studying, as always, from KJV, King James Version. So open that up to Hebrews chapter 7. I'm also going to have it up on the screen for those that are just watching on Periscope. Maybe you're at work. Maybe you're traveling. Uh, maybe you don't have a Bible handy. Uh, I'm going to have it up on the screen for you and we're going to go through it. You're, I'm telling you, this is a really good one to sit through or whether, you know, watch it on replay later. It's really, really good. I'm telling you it like, oh, it really blessed me. So I pray that it blesses you as well. So with that, I'm going to lead it, lead us into prayer really quickly and just let the Holy Spirit reveal whatever he wants to reveal to us today. So Lord, I just bless everyone on this podcast, on this podcast broadcast right now, Lord. And I thank you, Father God, for another awesome day, Lord, another awesome day in your presence, in your word, Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit reveal just your revelation, your mysteries, Lord, your um, your goodness and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, would you just continue to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, Lord. Holy Spirit, exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. And also, you'll see me, Shalom, you'll see me look down a few times um, because I do love the, the Bible study uh, it's called Dake's Annotated Bible. It's a really big book. It's huge. It's a fantastic Bible study book. It's a little pricey. I think it's like, well, I mean, it's about like $100 or something or $150. Um, but it's really worth it. Uh, and it's a fantastic Bible study book in that it goes through the Greek, it goes through the Hebrew. There's some great Bible studies for um, pastors as well. And it's it's a fantastic Bible study. So you'll see me look down a few times because... There are some great notes when it comes to um, all the chapters, but especially this chapter. So you'll see me looking down and make sure not to miss a thing, guys. I don't want to miss a thing. So amen. Pray. <clears throat> and I'm also going to pull up your comments like this, which is really cool. I love StreamYard. I've been using it. Pray wisdom, strength, power, joy, health, and blessings from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. So let me change and go into the Bible. Here we go. And oh, by the way, um, I have some worship music behind me, some, um, what is it called? Um, 
it's uh, like instrumental music. It's called, uh, yes, yeah, soaking music. So I hope that doesn't bother anyone. I don't know if you guys, can you guys hear that soaking music behind me? Um, I love it. It relaxes me, gets me into the presence and amen. Feet frozen. Oh no, is it frozen guys? No, don't tell me it's frozen. I hope not. <clears throat> is it okay? Let me know if it's good. Okay, here we go. We're going to jump into Hebrews chapter seven. Oh, before I do. Okay, cool. Not on your end. Good. So here's what's cool about this chapter, guys, is that, you know, the entire Old Testament, all of it points to the Messiah. And there was only one man in this entire world that fulfilled every prophecy about the Messiah, where he was going to be born in Bethlehem, going to be going to Egypt. He's going to be betrayed by his brothers. Um, he's going to, you know, be a mighty king, um, king of peace, right? So Jesus, and there's two entrances of the Messiah, right? There's an entrance of the Messiah as a meek lamb of God on the donkey, right? Which is how he came, how Jesus came into Jerusalem. But also he has a second entrance on the clouds in mighty glory and power with his angels behind him and his saints, which is, which is in Revelation as well. Um, also in Daniel and also in Ezekiel. And that's going to be his second coming, his return. Um, and I love it. I love to find passages in the New Testament that fulfill Old Testament prophecy, um, you know, especially having Jewish heritage, uh, I love to find, you know, information like this about the Lord in terms of um, him being the Melchizedek, the king of peace that is to come, um, who has an, an eternal glory, uh, no beginning and no end. And it's just it just it's mind blowing. And it's so awesome because I love to find passages like this to show this to my Jewish family who are not believers yet. But in, 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 in Jesus name, they will. I know they will. Um, the Lord told me they will, they're going to come to believe. So with that being said, let's jump into it because a lot of it is explained in um, Hebrews. So we're just going to go through it. I hope you can see it. It's a little small, but um, let's go through it. He Hebrews chapter seven <clears throat> for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, by the way, Melchizedek um, was an ancient king. So during the time of Abraham, King Melchizedek was one of one of the mighty kings, and he was the king of Salem. Uh, Salem Shalom means peace as well, means peace. So Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of peace. And he was alive during the time of Abraham. And Abraham, at this time, uh, in, in context with this chapter, Abraham just defeated a bunch of kings he went into war and he defeated a lot of them. And basically King Melchizedek of Salem, who was also a high priest, was also a priest of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and he came to bless Abraham and say, you know, well done. And you are highly favored of God and, and base and basically bless um, Abraham and, uh, and Abraham blessed him back and gave him tithes. And uh, that's just some context of what we're going to be reading. So for this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all tithes, right? 10% tithes. First being by interpretation, king of righteousness. And after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the son of God, abideth a priest continually. What does that mean? Melchizedek in Gen uh, Genesis 14, 18, which we're, I'm actually going to pull up right now. Genesis 14, 18, Melchizedek doesn't have a beginning or an end. It doesn't say where he's from. Well, it says he's the king of Salem, but it doesn't talk about who his mother is. Uh, the Bible doesn't mention who his father is. The Bible doesn't mention his death. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's very, um, it's like a picture of the Lord Jesus because Jesus even said, you know, I, I was before Abraham, you know, I, there was no beginning to, uh, to God, you know, God is if alpha to the omega, the, the beginning uh, and the end. He's, he, he was the, he, Jesus came from the ancient of days. And that was also the way that Melchizedek was presented. Um, there was no, you know, there was no beginning for him and there was no end for him. He's basically a representation of, Jesus. And um, we're also going to see a representation of a high priest that is to come, which is Jesus, which King David prophesied in Psalm 110, which I'm going to go through all of that as well. It's so beautiful because um, it's it it's in Psalm 110, it said that uh, there, there's going to be a king to come that will be that will um, go that will have an order that of uh that of uh, Melchizedek. So we're, we're going to go through it. I and mean, there's a lot. I, I don't even know where to start. There's like, there's so much. It's really cool. But let me read you 10 facts about Melchizedek. This is what's awesome. 10 facts about Melchizedek. Number one, he was the king of Salem, ancient Jerusalem. Um, two, he was a priest of, if, priest of God in Abraham's day. And you know, there are many, many, many different gods, but there's one God, right? One God of the Lord of Lords, the, you know, the God of everyone, um, who is God Yahweh, right? Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So he's the priest of God in Abraham's day. Three, he met Abraham returning from his military victory. So uh, again, Abraham's returning from his military victory, defeating all of these kings. He met up with Melchizedek, King Melchizedek. Abraham gave a tenth of his spoils, which by the way, back in the day, in ancient days, whenever you defeat, uh, it was a tradition, whenever uh, a, you know, group of people uh, or a country would defeat another nation or a nation would defeat another nation, it was typical that 10% of the spoils would go to, uh, to their worship. So, he, you know, Abraham uh, did that as well. He gave 10% of his tithes of the spoils to honor, worship, um, King Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is also called the King of Righteousness here in Hebrews 7. King of Righteousness, right? He's also called the King of Salem or King of Peace, right? This also fulfills um, <clears throat> where it says the Messiah is going to be called the, the Mighty Counselor, um, God Almighty, King of Peace, or actually it says Prince of Peace, but Jesus is the King of Peace. Seven, um, Melchizedek has no descent, Right. He has no gene genealogy, first of all, with the Levite priests. Right. And on top of that, there's no record again of his father and mother where he was born. There was it, there's no mention of his beginning of days and end of days, how he who he came from and uh, how he died. Um, but there were no recordings of it. So he's a he's a type Melchizedek. King Melchizedek is a type of Christ, a type of Jesus Christ without an eternal without um who what Jesus Christ being eternal, being really without beginning and end. Number eight, Melchizedek is a type of Christ, which we just said. So that Christ could be made a priest after his order, no beginning and no end, right? Nine, Melchizedek was an ordinary man. Melchizedek, King Melchizedek was an ordinary man. And also number 10, which is amazing too, is that King Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. He's mentioned as greater than Abraham, which we're going to see in Hebrews 7 and also in, um, in Genesis 14, 18 and Psalm 10, 110. So it's so cool because Jesus, the same way, was an ordinary man, but all God, right? God incarnate. Um, but he was, Jesus was an ordinary man, but he was greater than Abraham, as we saw. And we went through John chapter 8, John chapter 8, in the end of John chapter 8, uh, 58, John 8, 58, he said to uh, the, the Pharisees, he said, surely before Abraham was, I am. He mentioned, he told the priest that, hey, he's God. He used the word, he used the <clears throat> Yahweh title, I am. But Jesus also confessed that he was greater than Abraham because before Abraham was, Jesus was lived and Jesus was. Uh, so there was no beginning and end to him. And people wonder, is Mel was Melchizedek Jesus? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that Melchizedek um, 
was a type of Christ, was a type of Jesus in terms of uh, he fulfilled prophecy. The Lord Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of what King David said. And actually, let me jump to what King David said here. Um, let me jump into Psalm 110. Let's go here. This is beautiful. Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord. So this is King David prophesying this. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. So out of Jerusalem, there will be a rod of strength who will rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn, right? God, Yahweh, hath sworn and will not repent. When, when it says here in the Bible that God swears and will not repent, God doesn't have to swear. God, when he says something, he, he holds to it, right? When the Lord makes a promise, he doesn't have to swear. He just says, I'm going to do it. And he's faithful to keep it. The Lord does not have to swear because the Lord never lies. So the fact that God swears here and says he will not repent, that means this is 100% like something to focus on and 100% going to come true, right? The Lord hath sworn and will not repent that thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So the Lord that sat, right? Because King David is saying, the Lord said unto my Lord. So God is saying to God, the Lord is saying unto, that, unto my Lord that he will swear not repent that you, that the Lord is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. After the order of Melchizedek. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep reading five to seven because it's also interesting. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. The days of the Lord's wrath is gonna be when he returns, right? The second coming. Um, you know, the day of wrath. He shall judge, right? As is written in Revelation. He shall judge, right? The Lord. <laughs> After the order of Melchizedek, he shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore, shall he lift up the head. Amen. So what does it say here? The Lord said unto my Lord that he will be a ruler of nations, a judge and he is going to be, um, as a priest, he said, the Lord, you are, a, uh, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. 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 So the Lord Jesus, ooh, let me jump to, um, let me go back to sharing the Bible. Sorry, I'm getting a little better at this. Um, how to use this technology. I'm learning. Um, amen. Hallelujah. Oh, your comments. Let me see what you guys are saying. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> he spoke everything into existence. He cannot lie. Whatever he speaks become truth. Exactly. God doesn't have to swear because whatever he speaks is truth, right? So the Lord's saying, God, Yahweh, God of glory said, I swear and I will not repent that this mighty one who is coming after the order of Melchizedek, he will judge the world. He will come as a rod of strength out of Zion. And he will break all the prideful kings and he will come in the day of wrath, right? It's so good. Amen. Someone said it. Okay, great. Um, amen. That's a great point that God never has to swear. Never thought about that before. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? God doesn't have to swear. He's saying, verily, verily, what you know, when it says in the New Testament, verily, verily, when, when Jesus said, verily, verily, truly, truly, that means you better listen. You better listen. So if if God says, I swear and I will not repent, 
and my son is coming into this world and he's going to judge the world and he's going to save the world. Well, right. The Lord Jesus came the first time to save the world. And the second time he returns, it's to judge the world. So he came as a, as, as a humble prince, right? A humble prince on the donkey. And he's going to return as a mighty king on a horse, which represents power, authority, glory. Amen. It's so good. Okay. Let's jump back into Hebrews 7. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 7. Let's continue. Um, okay. Yeah. So he's, uh, amen. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Okay. Verse four, now consider how great this man was, meaning King Melchizedek. Consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Amen. Consider how great this ordinary man is, that Abraham, the patriarch Abraham, um, gave tenth of the spoils. And, and actually, I want to go through this really quickly. Oh, my hair is like weird. Um, look how cool this is. So... In the Old Testament, you can basically divide um, and see five main themes of the Old Testament being uh, patriarchy, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchy. Another theme, the second theme, uh, priesthood, right? This uh, royal priesthood, which by the way, uh, the Levites were the were the priesthood, right? Uh, which by the way, here's what's interesting. The Levite lineage, the Levite lineage includes obviously Aaron, Moses, it includes Miriam, Samuel, prophet Samuel, Ezekiel, Ezra, and Malachi. So the Levite, the Levite lineage were the, uh, the tribe of Levi, right? There's, there's 12 sons of Jacob, right? 12 sons of Israel, 12 sons of Jacob, Judah, um, Benjamin, and, and, and Levi, and, and all the others. So Levi, the tribe of Levi, Moses said would be the tribe of priests, right? Would be the priesthood. And it started with Aaron, right? Aaron and his sons. Again, Aaron and Moses were brothers. So uh, Moses as well was a tribe of Levi, right? And Moses was was the first, um, uh, well, actually it was Aaron's son who was the first uh, high priest. So here's what's cool. So actually, let's continue. I'll go back. Um, all of it's cool. So, so you have the patriarchy in the Old Testament. You have the priesthood. You also have kings, right? In the Old Testament, you have King David, you know, King Saul first, and then King David and all the other mighty kings, King Solomon. So you have, pre, uh, you have patriarchy, priesthood, kings. Then you have Old Testament parts of the judges, right? Judge, judges. And then the fifth part of the Old Testament is the prophets, is the prophets. So here's what's awesome is that all of these themes in the Old Testament was fulfilled through Jesus Christ, right? Jesus is a type of patriarchy, right? He came from Abraham actually before Abraham was, Jesus was. So, but here's what's interesting is that Jesus was the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He was the seed of the woman, right? In Genesis, the seed of the woman that was uncorrupt, that was uncorrupted, right? Abraham, I, Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That's why actually in Luke chapter three, in Luke chapter three, <clears throat> In Luke chapter three, thank you. Someone said um, that was Eliezer, Aaron's son. Amen. That's right. He was the first high priest. Amen. And it was actually called, um, they were, so the first high priest uh, is called the Kohen Gadol, Kohen Gadol, which uh, in, in other words, Kohanim, which is the uh, term that we call the high priest um, that were the descend descendants of, of, of Aaron. But um, gosh, uh, we're just talking. So yeah, so Jesus fulfilled Sorry, my kitty cat's eating. Um, so Jesus fulfilled all of these five. He was not, so yeah, we're, I was talking about the lineage of Luke chapter three. Sorry, I'm so excited. There's so much to get through and I it's just, it's so cool. It's mind blowing. Um, Luke chapter three follows the lineage of Jesus Christ all the way from Adam, right? Adam being the son of God, um, you know, then, you know, it follows a Abraham and it follows Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons, and it follows all the way, you know, from Judah and also from uh, all the way to the Lord Jesus, his, you know, his stepfather, Joseph. And anyway, it follows that entire lineage. So Jesus is of the patriarchy, right? Um, Jesus was is also the high priest, right? The Melchizedek order, uh, right? 
Psalm 110 again, that it was prophesied that there will be a new covenant, that this priest, Melchizedek, is higher than the priests of Levi, right? It's higher than the Levi priests. And we see that again in Hebrews 7. We're going to read it again. And we see that as well in Genesis 14, 18, where Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. So normally, again, you give tithes to your place of worship. Um, in Judaism, right, it's a temple, right? It's a synagogue uh, with Christians. And, and, and this is a topic that not a lot of Christians like to talk about in terms of tithes. People ask me, you know, what, what do you think about tithes? Well, if, if, if we are sons of Abraham through faith in the Lord Jesus, then um, if Abraham was tithing and it wasn't just a tradition with them, um, Obviously, with the spoils of war, you give 10% to place of worship, um, which at that time was Melchizedek as well, uh, you know, high, a priest of high priest of God. Um, if Abraham is tithing, I do believe we need to be tithing too. Um, you know, I tithe 10%. Uh, and I just started doing that, uh, I would say, with recently, three, four months ago, um, I had that revelation of tithing to not actually no, it was last year I went to a prophetic conference and I, I learned not to be, you know, not to hold on to my money so tightly to be, um, to have more faith in the Lord that he's going to provide everything. And when you do give, he gives more and he honors it. And it's not that we give to get more. It's we give to him and, and, um, to, uh, to bless him, right? Cause we, we, we know the Lord is going to provide, so, um, you know, it, it just broke me free from worry about money. You know, when you're free and you have, you know, you know, the Lord is a provider. You don't worry about, um, about, uh, you know, giving 10% because you know, the Lord is going to give you, he's, he's going to give it back and he's going to give it back more. And he's going to bless you. And anyway, so that my opinion about tithing is, um, Nick, are you getting frustrated? <laughs> I am live. Someone's asking, are you live? I don't. So when I talk about certain topics, I sometimes go on a rant and I forgive me if I am not um, seeing your comments right now. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Someone said, God said to test him, give 10% and he will bless you more. Amen. So yeah, I believe in tithing. I think it's very important. Um, I tie 10%. And you know, it's a topic not a lot of people talk about, but I think from this study, you will see the importance of it, especially if Abraham, if we're the seed of Abraham, he's doing it. Um, we should be doing it as well. But anyway, so Jesus, so the five themes of the Old Testament, right? Priesthood, patriarchy, king, right? King Jesus was is a king. Um, prophets, King Jesus was a prophet, right? Jesus was a prophet, is a prophet. Uh, and also a judge, right? The Lord will judge the world. He will judge the world when he returns. So he fulfills all five of the Old Testament again. And it's so cool. So let's go back to the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> verse four, Hebrews seven, verse four. Now, cons now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. And actually, I want to show you guys Genesis 14, 18. So go to Genesis 14, 18, Genesis 14, 18. I want to show you this because the, the author of Hebrews, which many people believe is, is Apostle Paul, um, is mentioning this and he's talking about Genesis 14, 18. So let's look at this. Let me share how awesome this is. <clears throat> and when Abraham heard, right, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to start with verse, uh, yeah, let, let's, let's go to verse 17. So again, Abraham, Abraham just defeated a bunch of kings. He went to war. Abraham went to war and he defeated a bunch of kings. And King Melchizedek of Salem came to visit him and bless him and, you know, to honor him and say, well done, you know, great job. You are, you know, you're, you're mighty and highly favored of God. And so Mel King Melchizedek came to bless Abraham. Verse 17, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of, I don't know how to pronounce it, of of whatever, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh which is the King's Dale, verse 18, right? Genesis 14, 18. 
And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abraham and said, blessed be Abram of the Most High God, right? This is Abram before he was Abraham. Um, God, remember, changed his name, Abraham, um, but this is this this is before he changed his name. His name was Abraham at the time, and he blessed him. So King Melchizedek blessed him and said, "Blessed be Abram, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand." And he, and Abraham gave him tithes of all of all the spoils of war. Abraham gave King Melchizedek ten percent, ten percent. So. Look how beautiful this is. 1418, Genesis 1418. Did you guys spot this? That's so incredible. Genesis 1418. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth what? Bread and wine. And he was the priest of the most high God. How awesome is that? Yeah, someone said we we uh, Claymore said we need to make have a separate Bible study on giving and tithing. I agree. I can I can go on a rant about that. That's a totally separate topic. And sorry to kind of go into it, but um, yeah, that's a total separate Bible study. But look how awesome this is. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. He was the mo priest of the Most High God. So what does this show us again? Right, uh, King David. King David promised, it was a prophecy, Psalm 110, the Lord hath sworn will not repent that the Lord is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek came to bless Abraham and what did he bring? Bread and wine, just like Jesus did, bread and wine. Bread represents his body, right? And wine represents the sacrificial blood that he left and, and, and died for on that cross for us. So my goodness, it's so beautiful because he, again, it's just, oh, it's just so good. Bread and wine. When I read that the other day, like a few weeks ago, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is, this is amazing. This is exactly, this is the Lord. This re is, is a representation of the Lord. And going back to Hebrews 7, Hebrews 7, 4. Let me see if you guys are. Hey, Bill. Someone said hello. Hey, Bill. God bless everyone that's joining. We are going through Hebrews chapter 7. Um, Hebrews chapter 7, right? Hebrews chapter 7. Wow. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, Melchizedek, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils of war. And verily, and truly, they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. And he whose descent is not counted from them receiveth tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises." Amen. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. As I may say so, as I may say, as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. I, I, I'll, I'll explain all of this in a second. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood for under it, the people received the law, what further need was there that any other priest <clears throat> should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed there is made of a necessity, a change also of the law for he of whom these things were spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Let's go back. There's so much to unpack here. There is so much to unpack here. 
<clears throat> Amen. So good. So, man. Amen. So good. Okay. What do I want to say? There's, there's so much. I don't know where to start. Um, so again, here's what, uh, here's what the author of Hebrews 7 is saying. He's saying it was prophesied that the Messiah, the Lord that is to come, is going to be after the order of Melchizedek. And the, and the author here is saying, I'm just going to say it's Apostle Paul because many believe it's Apostle Paul. I think it is too. Um, Apostle Paul is basically saying, you know, the Messiah is going to come after the order of Melchizedek. And how great a man was Melchizedek that even Abraham, patriarch Abraham, was tithing onto Melchizedek. And even though it was Abraham's grandchild, right, out of his loins came Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob had the 12 sons, the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Levi, Judah, Benjamin, and, and you know, and all the other 12 sons, right? The tribe of Levi was the priesthood, right? Was the royal priesthood that would carry on, you know, the laws of God. And they were, you know, the, the, the Levites were, um, were separate, obviously, from the other tribes, and they were consecrated unto God, right? They were royal priests of God. And actually, when, um, when the Israelites would defeat certain armies and would defeat certain nations and would own new land and basically take over new land, the Levites would not be landowners because their inheritance is God. So the Levites were um, were consecrated unto God, were consecrated as high priests unto the people of Israel. And then all the other tribes of Israel, all the other 11 tribes would tithe onto the Levites. And again, they were the high priests of the Israelites. So look at this. So what the Hebrew Hebrews author is saying here is that look how great this Mel King Melchizedek is right, who was a representation of Jesus Christ. Look how awesome and great he is in the fact that even Abraham is tithing onto him and his loins, right, out of Abraham's loins came the Levites, right, came the high priests of the tribe of Levi, right, the Levi priests in being in Abraham's loin are tithing onto him. So there's a greater order. So the Melchizedek order is greater than the order of the Levite high priest. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't that so awesome? And, and it's also saying in Hebrews 7, which I'll point out again, where it says, um, you know, first of all, King Melchizedek is not in the genealogy of Levi, right? Melchizedek is not in the genealogy of Abraham, right? You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had uh, 12 sons, one of them being the Levi being Levi, you know, and Levi being the priesthood, Melchizedek is not in that genealogy. He's separate, right? He's, 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 he's different. He's not in that genealogy. And, you know, Moses said it's going to be, you know, ge genealogy of Levi are going to be the priests, right? And, and what Hebrews 7 is showing and also Psalm 10, 110, and also Genesis 14, 18, is that this king, this order of Melchizedek is greater then the priesthood of Levi, of Levi. Amen. Let's jump through that again really quickly just to show you. Amen. Mm -hmm. How the commandment to take tithes. Yep. Well, actually, we, we went through that pretty well. Amen. Yeah, let's go to 14 really quickly. And then I want to go through some notes in Dake's an, uh, annotated Bible. It's really good. So 14, for it is evidence, evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. And actually that word sprang, um, I'm trying to remember the, the word was it's really cool. Uh, oh, anatello in Greek. Sprang means anatello is uh, the word anatello in Greek. And it means hath risen. And typically, generally, it's it's a word anatello used uh, to describe the sun rising, right? Like, you know, something really big is rising. And uh, that's the word given for Jesus Christ, right? The Lord sprang out. He rose out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke 
nothing concerning priesthood, right? The Lord Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi, right? Which Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek or in similarity of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> that verse 17, for he testified thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek is Psalm 110, which we just read. That is exactly Psalm 110 that, that's quoted here. Amen. Verse 15. And it's far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Amen. I want to jump into some of your comments here. Let's see what you guys are saying. <laughs> and I also want to go through Dake's annotated Bible because it's so good. It's so good. Aw, amen. <laughs> you guys are cute. Amen. Yeah, I want to jump in to show you something so good. So God designed, God designed the Levitical priesthood to be changed, right? Because of Psalm 110. Psalm 110 said that there, um, that again, that the Messiah, that the Messiah is going to be after the or Melchizedek. The Messiah, the Lord, who is going to come, who is going to judge the world, who is going to come in great glory, who is going to come as a lamb, is, is, is after the order of Melchizedek, which again is separate from the Levites and is greater than the Levites. That even Abraham was tithing onto Melchizedek, which shows how great you know, King Melchizedek is the representation of Jesus is um, that even Abraham is tithing to him. It's so good. So God designed the Levitical priesthood to be changed, right? The new covenant that's coming, it's going to change. It's not going to be after uh, the Levite tribe, you know, priesthood. It's going to be coming from the tribe of Judah, a mighty king, like a lion, right? Um, and which, so Psalm 110 which declares that Messiah should be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was not only a priest, but also a prophet and a king. King Melchizedek, king Melchizedek was also a prophet and a king. So there, so King Melchizedek of the Old Testament fulfilled three different tribes, um, prophet, king, and also a priest, which is interesting because Jesus Christ, the same thing. He fulfilled actually all five of the tribes, uh, all, all not, not of the tribes of what I'm talking about. If, for those that are just joining the themes, the five main themes of the Old Testament, right? Patriarch, priesthood, king, judge, and a prophet, right? King Melchizedek, you know, fulfilled three, whereas King Jesus fulfilled all five because King Jesus is also going to judge the entire world and he's a high priest and he's um, of the loin of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you know, Judah and, and, you know, the tribe of Judah. And he's also a high priest as well as, you know, King Melchizedek. So it's interesting because none of the, none of the Levitical priests, just to show you the authority that the King Melchizedek, the representation of King Melchizedek has over the Levitical priest, none of the Levitical priests exercised a double or triple office, right? The Levitical priests were just destined to be high priests. <clears throat> that was their job. Um, you know, uh, prophet Samuel was also of the tribe of Levi and he was a high priest and he was a prophet, right? He had the office of a prophet, but never did these Levitical priests ever have two or three offices where they were prophet, uh, king, and um and um, what was the third one? Prophet, king, and priest, right? Never. Amen. It's so good. Uh, <clears throat> and here's what's also cool. The eternal priesthood, the eternal priesthood typified by Melchizedek was the original priesthood, right? There was no beginning or end to him, right? Again, in Genesis 14, 18, it doesn't ever tell us where this King Melchizedek came from, who his mother, who was father was, who his sister was, you know, uh, whose mother and father was, it doesn't talk about how he dies. It's like, 
you know, it kind of has a representation of eternality, right? It's eternal. That there's no beginning or end to him. Um, and it existed. And again, um, it existed 400. Yeah. Well, here's what it says. It existed over 400 years before the Levitical order. Yeah. King Melchizedek existed be 400 years before the Levitical order of high priests. Um, over 600 years after the Levitical priesthood, King David, uh, by the Holy Ghost, predicted that another perfect priest would arise, King Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek. The law, here's what's awesome. The law, therefore, right, the law of Moses, that the Levitical tribe was the tribe of priesthood did not contain, right? The law of Moses did not contain the original priesthood because again, Melchizedek came before Moses, came before, um, you know, the law where it says the Levites are the, high, are the high priest, right? King Melchizedek was before the tribe of Levites and that Levitical order of priesthood, right? The law therefore did not contain the original priesthood, right, the one that Moses gave, which existed typically in Melchizedek and became a reality in Jesus Christ. The Messiah of whom these things were predicted did not come from the tribe of Levi, right? Tribe of Judah we talked about. Amen. It's so good. So God designed the Levitical priesthood to be changed, right? A new covenant, a new order um, that the Messiah in Psalm 110 was going to be after the order of Melchizedek, which again, I know I'm repeating myself so many times. You're probably like, like why are you repeating yourself? I know. Um, I just think it's so fascinating that, you know, Jesus is separate from the Levi tribe, right? He's from the tribe of Judah. He was a high, he is a high priest. He, he is a king. He is a prophet. Um, he is the seed of the woman in Genesis, right? He is the seed of the woman who will trample on the, uh, head of the seed of the serpent. And he just fulfills all of it. I just think it's so awesome. I love, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just so enamored by this, um, by this study. Just so cool. Let me show you again. Um, Psalm 110, <clears throat> Psalm 110. Let's open it up. Okay. Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of strength out of Zion. Rule that in the midst of thine enemies. I'm going to skip the next. I'm going to jump to verse four. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Amen. Yeah, for the ones that are like commenting and being a little distracting in the chat, we're doing a Bible study. Please have some respect. You don't need to, um, you know, talk about any kind of my looks or anything like that. Let's just keep it holy. Let's keep it focused. Um, let's keep it respectful too. you know, not just respectful to me, but everyone else in the chat that are really we're doing a Bible study here. Right. We're doing a Bible study here. So please have some respect. Okay. Let's not be distracting. Um, but yeah, this is so good. It's so good, right? Do you guys have any comments? Anything that you feel that, this, you know, that you see here that I missed um, <clears throat> in, in Hebrew 7, Genesis 14, 18, or Psalm 110? There's some really fantastic notes here. I, I want to make sure I get through as well. Amen. Yeah. And tithes, again, is a separate topic, which we can talk about next time. Um, but yeah, oh, this is cool. And if Abraham paid, if Abraham paid tithes to King Melchizedek, his Abraham's natural and spiritual seed, because we're obviously Abraham's spiritual seed, right? We're Abraham's spiritual children through faith, right? Abraham was made righteous, was seen as righteous through his faith in God. We are seen as righteous in our faith in the Lord Jesus, who came from the sea and lineage of, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, so if Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, this is something to think about. If Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, his natural and spiritual seed should continue to pay tithes to this priesthood, the priesthood of Jesus Christ, since it is now since it now replaced the Aaronic or Aaronic, right? The priesthood of Aaron. 
Amen. <clears throat> oh, here's what's. In, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, this is good. Um, Jay, that is. Let me see. What verse is this in, in, in Hebrews? This is a really interesting one, too. Hebrews 7, verse. I'll tell you right now. Verse J. Okay, verse 8. Hebrews 7, verse 8. Hebrews 7, verse 8. I want to show you this. This is interesting. I meant to go through this before. Um, Hebrews 7, verse 8. <clears throat> Let's pull it up and open it. Ah, computer's lagging. Hebrews 7, verse 8. 7, 8. Okay. This one right here. And hear men that die. Okay, so I'll go back to 7 for a second. 7-7, seven, seven, Hebrews 7-7. Seven, seven. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here, verse 8, men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. Verse 9, and as I may so say, Levi also who receive tithes, pay the tithes in Abraham, right? Again, Levi and Abraham did, didn't live at the same time, right? Levi was Abraham's um, great grandson, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It was Jacob's son, Levi. So it was his great grandson. So he's saying that Levi also, who receives tithes, pays tithes into Abraham, right? Because he's a loin of Abraham. Um, and Abraham is, is again tithing unto Melchizedek, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So what is what is this trying to say? This is a really cool, um, really cool interpretation of this. <clears throat> and again, Dake's annotated Bible. If men that die receive tithes, if men that die receive tithes, they continually they who live receive them, right? That is, if temporary priests, right? If temporary, you know, short living priests have received tithes, how much more should the eternal priests receive them? So how much more, you know, if we're tithing onto living priests, right? And also the ones that may have died and, you know, in, into their ministry, how much more should we tithe into eternal priests, which is again, Messiah, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, right? Amen. You know what? If, if this guy is still going, I can mute him in my, um, I think he left though. Yeah. <laughs> Next time I'll have my um, my periscope up as well, my so I can block and mute people. I try not to block anyone because I want them to hear the word of God. I'll mute them so they can they can listen and be blessed. <laughs> it's always better. Um, amen. It's so good. Am I missing anything? No, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. So it, this is like the overall theme again. The Messiah, right? Hebrews seven whole what what, what the, just the breakdown of it the theme of this is that the messiah of whom these things were predicted right psalm 110 the messiah would be after the order of melchizedek um that things that were predicted about about the messiah did not come from the tribe of levi and had no levitical pedigree right he wasn't in the genea jesus was not in the genealogy of the tribe of levi he was jesus from the genealogy of judah right? The other brother. Um, so Jesus had no Levitical uh, pedigree to prove his claim to priesthood. But, um, you know, Paul speaks with confidence that Christ came from Judah, right? He sprung out of Judah, right? The Anotella of Judah, right? He rose out of Judah like a mighty king, according to the official Jewish genealogies, the genealogies of both uh, Matthew and, and, and Luke, which we went through, um, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, the, the rest. But so, yeah. Oh, so yeah. So Jesus was a high priest from another order. I'm just repeating myself over and over again. Sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, it's so good. So praise the Lord. Anything else that I'm missing, guys? Do you see anything that you want to comment about? Have your comments up. Amen. Anything else, guys? I'm missing. So good. And that's basically the gist of it. It was just really cool to be able to have this revelation of, wow, another thing that the Lord fulfilled in the Old Testament, Psalm 110, Genesis 14, 18. And what's also cool about Genesis 14, 18 was that this king of Salem, right, this king of peace, this king Melchizedek of Salem, 
king of peace, who was a representation of Jesus Christ. King Melchizedek came to Abraham, Genesis 14, 18. King Melchizedek came with what? With bread and with wine. Mm, and Abraham tithed onto him. That's so awesome because that's a representation of the Lord Jesus. We are to tithe onto him. And, um, you know, Jesus, the representation of bread and wine, his body and his blood, you know, he was, his body represents the, his obedience, right? The Lord Jesus, when he said, eat this, eat this bread for this is my body, the body that he sacrificed <clears throat> for us, the body that he sacrificed in obedience, his body fulfilled all of the laws. He, Jesus Christ never sinned once, right? He fulfilled every single Mosaic law, 613 Mosaic laws, right? Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not lust, do not steal, do not lie, right? Jesus was the only one in the entire world that was able to fulfill all of those laws. So his body was a living sacrifice of obedience, not only onto the father whose will it was for him to come here, right? Jesus, you know, fulfilled was obedient unto death, but his body was obedient unto all of the 613 laws, which is, here's what's also cool. This is another, the, the another thing that's, that's awesome is that there's a reason why the Lord, the Messiah, Jesus Christ was of another order. Think about it. Why is Jesus of another order? Why is he the order of Melchizedek under, after the order of Melchizedek? Why? Why not after the order of the Levites? Why was the Messiah Jesus after the order of Melchizedek and not after the order of the Levites? <clears throat> Think about it. I believe, and this is what it's showing, and there's a reason why Abraham was tithing onto King Melchizedek and after his order, that again, it had no beginning, no end, right? This eternal um, priesthood, which is a representation of Jesus. It's because King, we, 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 I kind of hinted at, I kind of hinted it uh, before. King Jesus, when he lived, he fulfilled every single law, 613 uh, laws of Moses, which no one could literally follow. No one, even the priests, the Levitical priests could not fulfill every single law. Jesus is of another order. He's of another order completely that was able to fulfill every single law. And he's greater than the law. <laughs> he's greater than the law, right? He fulfilled every single law and he's of another order. So it's showing again, that, you know, the Levitical priests, the tribe of Levi, the Levitical priests that come from the loin of Abraham and Abraham was tithing onto King Melchizedek and Jesus Christ is after the order of King Melchizedek, who was a prophet, who was a king, who was very blessed, who, um, who was also a high priest. You know, Jesus comes after that order. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It, it's just mind blowing. Like, I'm so blessed by reading this. I hope you are blessed too. Amen. God in human form. That's why Jesus was able to fulfill every prophecy. So again, Jesus's body was the um, sacrificial body for us. He, his, his sacrifice, you know, his obedience unto the father, his obedience unto every single law that we're not even able to keep. No one's able to keep except him because he's perfect. Um, and also his sacrificial blood you know, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. It's so good. Yeah, there was a verse here. There was like a, another, um, another comment I wanted to say. Yeah, I think this is it. Yeah, sarkikos, sarkikos, which is a Greek word. Um, <clears throat> Uh, when it's when we talked about the carnality, right? The word carnal, carnal commandment that uh, it was in Hebrew seven. Um, the word carnal does not always mean sinful or corrupt, but sometimes feeble, frail, or human, right? Carnal being human, frail, feeble. 
The idea here is that Christ was not appointed a priest after the order of Aaron, wherein weak and perishing men must succeed each other. But Jesus was made of a high priest from another order after the power of immortality or endless life, right? So Jesus is from another order of endless life, eternal life, um, you know, righteousness, fully righteous, right? Because King Salem, right? King Melchizedek in verse one of Hebrews, Hebrews seven, verse one, King Melchizedek was a righteous, is king of righteousness, king of peace, um, a blessed high priest, right? Who, who blessed the father and blessed Aaron and, and his lineage and his people. It's so good because Jesus is of another order. Um, someone said, I've been studying. I have been struggling with the Bible study. I don't know why I have been coming to your page for help. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're having trouble with this, this Bible study. I know I'm kind of jumping around a lot, but if you're saying in general, yeah, this is, I, I, Bible study is not, it's not, I shouldn't say it's not easy, but there, there's so much that's so, there's so much to unpack and there, it's so beautiful. And I was saying this in the beginning of the broadcast is that there it's the Bible is a living, breathing word. The more you read it, you're never going to read a verse the same way again. Every time you read it, it it's unpacked even deeper and even more. Um, it's so interesting because the Bible is written over was written over the span of 1500 years by over 40 different authors, all breathed and inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it all has the very similar themes, right? It all, it all, all the Old Testament points to the Messiah. It all points to, first of all, how good and faithful our, our God is, how merciful he is. Um, even though, you know, the Israelites kept turning away from him, kept sinning against him, kept committing spiritual adultery um, with, with making idols and with, you know, intermarrying and all of this stuff, um, how it shows the Old Testament how good our God is, how merciful he is, how faithful he is, how gracious he is to forgive us. But it also points to the Messiah, the first the, the savior of the world, who's going to judge the entire world. So every time I read the word and I know you guys do too, it's, 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 there's, it's deep. It's so deep. And you can spend an entire lifetime studying the Bible and going through it. And I think that, I don't think our studies are going to end in this life. I think it's going to continue even when we're, you know, with the Lord. Um, there's just so much to unpack. And I've, you know, I've heard of people who, who have seen heaven and have been to heaven. They, they saw people, you know, studying the word, continually studying the word because it's so deep. There's so much to unpack. And it's such a blessing if you take the time to go through it. And I know that might have been like all over the place today, but um, there's, it's, it, it, oh, it's so good. It's so deep and it's so good. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen to this. Yep. Knowing Jesus in your heart will open all doors, yet it is a narrow path. It is a narrow path. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to, you know, you can find yourself sometimes having a hard time getting into the word. I mean, I'm just saying for me, maybe people that are new believers or let's say, you know, maybe you don't even know the Lord yet. Um, I have a lot of agnostics and atheists that, that tune in here and there and leave me a comment and, you know, don't really maybe are not interested in the word, but when they really, when they open up the Bible, they realize this is interesting. It is interesting. It's so deep. There's so much to unpack. There's so much revelation. There is so many silver linings that are held all the way, you know, from the new Testament, all the way back to the old Testament. If you just take the time to just look through it and study, it's so good. It's so interesting. And the Bible is unlike any other book in the world. There are over 2,500 different prophecies. A lot of them came to pass. A lot of them happened. And there are still some that we're waiting for and living through right now. Um, the Bible is unlike any other book in the world where, again, it's a living, breathing book where you're unpacking it and getting more revelation every time you read it. It's so good. And this is, again, Hebrews 7. The reason why I'm excited again for this, this to go through this chapter is because... You know, again, it's it fulfills prophecy, fulfills Psalm 110, fulfills, uh, it explains Genesis 14, 18. You know, Jesus is of another order, right? His high priesthood is of another order. King Melchizedek, king of peace, king of righteousness. It's so good. It's like, wow, it really blew my mind when I read this. And I hope it's 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 uh it's inspired you as well. Um 
it's beautiful, I think. And uh, I might not have given it justice by explaining it, but um, I hope you can even look through this on your own time as well and just read again, you know, chat Hebrews 7, Psalm 110. And it's so good. <clears throat> yeah. I was trying to see if there's any other notes that I wanted to go through. Yeah. Yeah. So again, really quick. So again, Jesus Christ did not have a genealogy of the, the, the Levite priests, right? On the other hand, since they recognized Melchizedek as a true priest of God, right? Since Abraham recognized Melchizedek as a true priest of God and greater than Abraham, that Abraham was giving him 10% of his tithes. They had to recognize, meaning the Levitical priests had to recognize that genealogy, or actually not even just the Levitical priests, but also the Pharisees and also anyone today, we have to recognize today, and I'm talking to my Jewish community out there, you guys, we have to recognize that as Abraham considered King Melchizedek, priest Melchizedek, greater than his own, you know, genealogy, his own Levitical priests that are to come. And it has nothing to do with genealogy, right? Since Abraham considered Melchizedek a high priest of God greater than Abraham, then we have to recognize that genealogy is not the most essential thing for a priest. And that on these grounds, right? It's not just the, it's not that Levitical priests are, are only that tribe can be a high priest, right? Because again, King Melchizedek was not a, a Levitical priest. He was not a tribe of Levi because he wasn't alive yet, right? He was a separate order. And therefore, on these grounds, Jesus Christ could be a priest after the order of Melchizedek to fulfill Psalm 110. This proves that Melchizedek priesthood had commandment to take tithes of Abraham as the Levites were commanded to take tithes of all Israel. If Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, his natural and spiritual seed should continue to do the same. Amen. I think I went around through all the comments I wanted to read through. It's so good. Amazing. God. Amen. <clears throat> God was and is today working in so many ways. Amen. Hallelujah. He sure is. He sure is. Someone said um, he was Jesus. This is interesting. I hear this a lot. Um, you know, that Melchizedek was Jesus. I don't know if he was Jesus. There are people that, that, that think that. I, and this is just my opinion, um, I don't think he was Jesus. I think he was a real king of Salem who was a representation of Jesus. I think he's a representation of Jesus. I think that, um, um, you know, he was like a, a, a symbol of Jesus. Um, I think he was just, you know, a regular man, um, you know, who had, uh, who was highly respected as a high priest of God that Abraham tithed to. So it shows his authority in terms of uh, being representation of God. So some people think that he was Jesus. I, I uh, in terms of, you know, I don't know, Jesus walking the earth back. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think he was just, I think he was a separate King, um, you know, and I think again, in Psalm 110, it says that the Lord who is to come is going to be after the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek was a living man who um, had his own order of priesthood, right? That, had no beginning and no end. It was eternal, an order of righteousness, um, an order of, of, of a king, of a judge. <clears throat> so I don't think he was Jesus. I think that, uh, I think that's unbiblical, you know, considering Psalm 10 uh, scripture. So I, I don't think he was Jesus. I think he was just uh, King Melchizedek as a representation of Jesus. Yeah, amen. He was the king of Salem, mm -hmm. Jerusalem right? Ancient Jerusalem. Uh, and Shalom, Salem, Shalom means peace. It means peace. So the king of peace, the king of Salem, the king of Jerusalem, Shalom. Amen. So good. Anything else I missed here? I think that's it, guys. I think that's it for today. We have a, 
I was going to say short Bible study, but we started at 2.30. I had internet problems. Thank you for hanging in there. Say, though, that we would be. Yeah, amen. That's right. Jesus did say that we would be doing, um, right? Jesus said you will be doing uh You'll, you'll be doing works and even greater works than I did. Amen. Uh, do I know where you can buy a chauffeur? It's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I My friends buy it in Jerusalem, but I'm sure there's a place you can, you can order it. You can order it, but I'm not sure. But anyway, guys, bless you. My throat's still kind of <clears throat> still recovering from that annoying cold I had, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, someone said Amazon. You can order it on Amazon. Amen. Okay. Well, God bless you. Thank you for staying, tuning in. And if you're watching the replay, um, I hope this blessed you and I bless you in Jesus name. I leave you with, uh, you know, the peace of the Lord, maybe upon you and your family. I pray just a deep peace, right? May the King of peace just encompass you, fulfill you, fulfill you, and just lean on the Lord through these very weird times that we're living in. Um, and you know, a great shaking that a lot of people have lived through with the coronavirus and everything. And, um, just be encouraged, be encouraged that God is with you. You are not alone. You might be living alone, but you are not alone in your home. Um, the Lord is with you at all times. He's always looking over you. And if you ever feel a time where, you know, you're feeling stressed out or even, you know, whatever, to lean, get into the word of God because this world is wild and there's a lot of things going on and it's a very wicked world and try to find some time throughout the day to open up the word, to, to read, to study, to meditate, um, to spend time with him. God bless all of you. God is good. God sees all your problems and all your troubles and he's there with you. You are not alone. Um, if there's a door closed, that, that there's an obstacle in front of you that is not opening, there's, there's a reason for it either it's to make you stronger or sometimes it's not meant it's not meant for you to walk through that door so i pray that the lord opens up doors in your life that are meant for you to be opened for you and your life and your destiny and i bless you with the peace of christ um <laughs> amen you are yeah refocus on you are quiet today so thanks for the good study anna I'm melancholy today and quiet for but following along i'm happy you're here um refocus on thank you for joining as always and it's sometimes good to just not see anything, just to listen, meditate, read the word. Um, you're welcome. You're very welcome since I'm here. Amen. Well, God bless everyone. Until next Monday, until next Monday, guys, I will see you. And uh, we're going to go get into Romans chapter four with Kisena Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Hopefully we have no internet problems and hopefully we can just jump right into it and everything will be good. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful day in Jesus name. Amen.